Hello and welcome to another wondrous installment of Bedtime Tales. Stories by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. We're getting into the home stretch here. I think, let's see, 106 to 144. Yeah, we're, we're getting into the home stretch. And I already see something interesting on this upcoming page. All right, so let's start it off with Mouse in a China Store. One day, Henry Mouse poked his nose out of his mouse hole and into the store which he had explored so many times before. It was a candy store, and Henry always found something tasty to eat there. Today, though, he had a big surprise. Gone were the jars of brandy balls, the chocolate bars, and the peppermint sticks. Gone, too, was the smell of candy. Henry stood on his hind legs and jumped onto a shelf. There, face to face with him, was a cat. It was a very strange looking cat, white with green flowers, and it was not much bigger than Henry himself. Call yourself a cat, Henry jeered. He knocked it off the shelf and it crashed into tiny pieces on the floor. Next, Henry climbed up a pink jar to look inside for chocolate drops. The jar tilted and Henry went flying through the air as the jar fell. He ran here and there, sending displays of mugs, tea services, and crystal glasses flying everywhere. Then suddenly, Henry smelt sugar. There, in a cracked dish he had just knocked over, was some pink and white candy. He licked one. Delicious! Henry Mouse crept back into his hole again, a sugared almond in his mouth. These won't last long, said Henry. I'll look for a new home tomorrow. Wow. Okay. This is just one of the stories that's kind of there. there. Yeah. Apparently it was a candy shop. Now it's a china shop. Yes. And now the windmill. This may be one of the shortest stories in here because this is like a three quarters page illustration. Yeah, it's like what? Two paragraphs? Three maybe? Technically three, because there's an indentation, there's an indentation, and they never indent the first line of a story. I'm not sure why. There was once an old windmill that stood on a hill. Its sails were broken, and it was many years since it had been used. It was very lonely, and it longed for the sound of human voices. One day it heard some children playing outside. We're going to live here, one of them said. The windmill couldn't believe what it had heard. Surely children weren't strong enough to grind the grain. But later, some workmen arrived. The old windmill was hammered and painted and tidied up. Soon it was a cozy home for the children and their parents. And though its sails never turned, the windmill wasn't lonely anymore. Okay, that's kind of a sweet sentiment, but it's just there and it's like so we. This, this book's definitely designed to multiple stories when you're reading to your kids. Mm-hmm. Also, there's the Lonely Windmill with tattered uh, blades. They call them sails, but yeah. Tattered sails. No cloth on them, it's just wood. And there is the kids playing ball around the base of the windmill. I'm surprised it didn't end with, and so they did, because there's not much here to work with. Yeah. Most of the story in that particular one is, like, told in the illustration. Oh, I don't think anyone's ever heard this one. The Three Little Pigs. I mean, really. Hey, wasn't there a song about this? Probably. Uh, definitely. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs, and each of them built a house. The first little pig built his house out of straw, and very smart it was, too. The second little pig built his house out of wood. But the third little pig built his house out of brick. And though the house was plain, it was very sturdy. Presently, along came a wicked old wolf. The three little pigs rushed into their homes. But with a huff and a puff, the wolf blew down the straw house and gobbled up the first little pig. Then he went to the second little pig's house. He huffed and he puffed and he blew down the wooden house and gobbled up the second little pig. Then up to the brick house came the wicked old wolf. But though he huffed and puffed until he had no breath left, he could not blow it down. 
the wicked old wolf slunk away, very disappointed. He was never seen in those parts again, and the third little pig lived in a strong plain house to the end of his days. And there's some versions of this where the other pigs manage to run to each consecutive house. Yeah, this is a bit more traditional. Mm -hmm. Where only the one who takes the time to build a sturdy home survives. Mm -hmm. Though you would think after the first two pigs he'd be full. Yeah. There was also a story where that was going on. Like, well, you know, it was already dead. I couldn't let the meat go to waste. <laughs> children's book about how he was framed ah and yeah they they've illustrated the puff of air they've given both the wolf and the pig clothing and the pig's house has nice shingles on it i wouldn't mm -hmm. call that plain no i wouldn't either it's not like extravagant but yeah but for a little house out in the woods i think it's fine yeah all right i don't see any alligators the dancing hippo Belinda had always wanted to be a ballet dancer. It's the dream of many a small girl, but Belinda was different. Belinda was a hippopotamus. Don't be silly, said her mother. Hippos don't dance. You'd break the stage. Belinda looked all over the country for a ballet school, but none of them would take a hippo. Only humans were meant to dance, it seemed. Mm. Never seen a cat or a bird. There's only one thing to do, said Belinda. I'll start my own ballet company. So Belinda formed the BBC, which stood for Belinda's Ballet Company. It was just for hippos, and it was a huge success. It was surprising how many hippos there were who wanted to dance. Hmm. And those are some very nice-looking hippos in tutus. Yes. Like I said, we're missing the alligators. Oh. Oh, I see what you're referencing. I see what she's referencing. I'm not going to say anything, but... Let's just say the company that made it, their name starts with a D. <laughs> also, this reminds me of something I learned recently. Apparently, um, um, do you remember the name of this creature in the Bible? Um, it's not behemoth or something like that. It's, it's another thing we think of a large sea creature. Leviathan? Leviathan. The description of the Leviathan actually matches a hippo perfectly. Hmm. Interesting. Also a very short story, but a combination of don't give up on your dreams. And do it yourself. Yeah. This is how a lot of software gets invented, by the way. Why isn't there something that does this? This would be so handy. I'm a programmer. Da -da 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 -da. Hey, okay, this just made my life easier. Hmm, wonder if I can sell it. All right. Huh, they gave them with pigs. Hmm. Piggy bank this time. Hmm. The China piggy bank was very handsome, but he wasn't happy. He wanted to meet some real pigs. So one day, piggy bank jumped from the windowsill and set out. Very soon he came to a farmyard, and he could see some very large and very dirty animals snuffling in their trough. What funny creatures, thought piggy bank. I wonder what they are. Pigs, of course, said one of the animals. And what are you? I'm a pig too, said piggy bank. But you're covered in pink flowers, said a pig, and you've got a slot in your back. And all the pigs laughed at him. Piggy Bank trotted sadly back to his window sill, and there was something waiting for him, a blue glass pig. Piggy Bank had found a friend. It doesn't even describe the other friend, but we can see that it's a, uh, it's a blue pig. It says blue glass pig. Oh, yeah. Ah. I my somehow my brain wanted more description. I was waiting for that, but then hit that. Gotcha. Good job. Uh, also, like pigs are actually surprisingly clean. Yes. Along with the fact that they actually do an excellent job of managing their appetites. And the art's nice. Like I said, the bottom has a nice visual of the blue pig and the other pig, Banks. Mm -hmm. And... There's the other pigs, the life-size pigs eating out of a trough. With Piggy Bank looking up at them. Mm -hmm. Nice size deferential. Yep. All right. And now, bookworm. Hmm. Horrible story. <laughs> I think I know why. Charlie loved going to the library. He's a proper bookworm, said Mom. 
dives into every book he can get his hands on. One day, Charlie was standing by the shelves wondering what he could take out, when a little voice suddenly said, Why don't you try Mystery at Hollyhock Farm? Charlie turned around, but there was nobody there. Here I am, said the voice again. It came from the shelf. Charlie peered more closely and saw a very tiny black and white worm staring back at him with bright eyes. I'm a bookworm, it explained. I just love words. Charlie pulled out the book the bookworm had told him to read. But it's got no words in it, he exclaimed. I know. I've eaten them, said the bookworm. You could write in your own words, it said helpfully, if I tell you the story. But this is terrible, said Charlie. If you eat all the words, nobody can enjoy the books. And the bookworm started to cry. But I live on words, he said. What can I do? Charlie thought hard. I know, he said. I'll bring you all Dad's old newspapers. You can eat them instead. This seemed to be a very good idea. So each time he went to the library, Charlie would take piles of old newspapers and the bookworm ate all the words. Sometimes Charlie forgot. So if you ever go to the library and find a book with no words in it, you'll know exactly what happened. I, I see why she says it's a horrible story. Yes. Because if you couldn't tell already, especially if you're watching these particular mm -hmm. videos, she really likes books. And I think I mentioned before in one of the other recordings that she had a good teacher of a librarian when it came to showing the horrors of what happens to library books. Yes, yes. And... It's a single image this time, and that kind of, the, the outfit he, he's wearing kind of reminds me of, like, sleepwear jammies more than actual, mostly the big fluffy shirt and the way the pants look. And they gave the worm both arms and legs and a beak, so it didn't look very worm-like. Yeah, no. Yep. I was just making sure that it wasn't some other line that was making it look like it had a beak. Well, if you're interested in stories about things that eat books I only read two of them because I don't know if it was just the translation or overall the writing driving me crazy look for book girl and if you like people who can do amazing things with paper I recommend read or die now how about the tea party witch yeah Miranda knew that Miss Stone was a witch even if she didn't look like one she had a black cat a cauldron and a black sack full of magic. Miranda had seen her carrying them all into the house on the day she moved in. And today she was coming to her mom's tea party. Miss Stone arrived in an elegant cream-colored dress and a big floppy hat. She sat daintily on the edge of her chair and nibbled some sandwiches. Miranda thought she must have made a mistake. But then Miss Stone suddenly leapt to her feet and pointed toward the sky. Bother that cat, she cried. I told it to stay at home. Miranda looked out of the window and had a shock. There was Miss Stone's black cat sailing over the treetops on a broomstick. <laughs> I like the illustrations in this one. And not all witches look like what we classically call a witch. Mm -hmm. That's actually another one of those more modern than you think it is creations. Kind of like how we currently view Santa Claus. Thank you, Coca-Cola. Yes. Older images of St. Nicholas are very different. Even ones that are new enough to be made out of plastic. My, my father has one of uh, Father Christmas. Still in red, but much older design. Yeah, and if you go back further, he is eventually blue. Also still blue in some countries. The art's very lovely. I like the way the woman's drawn. And there's the poor little girl. Yep. Looking over. Well, let's do two more because they're short. Garden Pond. Matthew wanted to have a pond. His dad had a good idea. He went to a store and bought the biggest plastic tub he could find. Then he dug a hole in the yard and sank the tub into it. Now fill it with water, he said. After that, dad and Matthew bought some fish weed and a plastic bucket with a water lily in it. They sank it all in the pond, and later they added some frog's eggs. Because, you know, you can just pick those up at any store. Well, not any store, but I'm pretty sure there are stores out there that sell them. Mm-hmm. One day, Matthew went to look at his pond, and he saw a tiny frog sitting on a lily pad. Wow. 
Yes, that's the entire story. That's why I decided we should go ahead and do these two. The Bonfire. It was the fall, and the yard was covered with fallen leaves. Will you help me sweep them up, Steve? asked Dad. Then we can make a bonfire. So Steve and Dad swept up a pile of leaves as tall as Steve. Then Dad added some tree branches that had been blown down in a big storm. Now we'll light the bonfire, he said. It was an enormous bonfire. Steve and his friend Jill from next door danced round it. Then Mom let them have a couple of potatoes wrapped in tinfoil, and Dad poked them into the hot embers. Baked potatoes! Yummy! said Steve. The bonfire was worth all the hard work. An idea just hit me. If you're a creative parent who's good at telling stories, you could use just the small ones as a starter and then mm -hmm. just build off the story. Yeah. Like suddenly the frog turned giant and started making, started like attacking and doing things and random stuff. Yes, just random things. We even get the kid involved and go, and then what happened? Yeah. And yeah, bonfire. Uh, no, right now it's kind of summer, also high fire risk. We had burn piles, but never bonfires. Same at my house, and the kids are pretty well drawn, though the face on the girl looks a little off. The fire doesn't look very fiery. Yeah, it looks, it's kind of hard to describe. You'll see the image, but, and then we just have a lily pad with a frog on it. Very nicely drawn. Yeah, very nicely rendered frog. All right, I think we have less than 30 pages left, but we will get to it another day. This has been another installment of Bedtime Tales, written by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. Um, if you haven't caught up on this one yet, check out the rest of the playlist for it. If you are caught up, check out other playlists. If your name begins with Sasami-chan, I'm not sure there's anything left for you, but thanks for coming by. Um, for everyone else, if you've checked out all the Embers Reading Room videos or you want something different, check out the main section of the channel, which comprises of our Saturday podcasts, which are pop culture, mainly anime and video games and ponies and blah. <laughs> Sorry, that one's not getting old for me. No, no, it's not. And also has Lux's drawings, which is fun. So, now because this is my section of the channel, we have a link to buy the book. We have a link to Rakuten, formerly Ebates, for shopping rebates. I'm tempted to just throw all my referral links in here at some point, but nobody clicks and I don't want to make it too crowded. <laughs> Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content in the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.